And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to hear, um, hear from our um, wonderful panelists on today's webinar. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Lisa Morris, our managing director of our uh, philanthropic arm of Force Family Office. So Lisa, um, take it away. Great, thank you, Kelly. So as Kelly just said, I'm Lisa Morris. I'm director of philanthropic services for Force Family Office. And I'm very excited about the panel that we have today. You're gonna to hear from two amazing organizations. Uh, one is called the Afia Foundation. And I did put in the chat uh, a link uh, to donate if you are so inspired throughout the presentation. Um, we have with us Danielle, who's going to tell us all about her foundation and the life-saving work that they are doing. And we also have one of my personal heroes, Jonathan Greenwald uh, from the Greenwald Family Impact Foundation. And he will tell you about what his family does, how they apply impact into both their impact investments and their nonprofit work, and how they're working with Afia. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Danielle, who will tell us her story about how she created Afia and why, and why they're doing such incredible work. So I'm going to mute myself and Danielle, take it away. Okay, so thank you. And thank you Forest Family Office for the opportunity to be here today. And by means of introduction, I am the CEO and the founder of Afia. And every story has its beginning. So I'm going to share mine with you now. And 13 years ago, I was downsized from a major executive position at a Fortune 500 company and I was at a crossroads. I wasn't sure if I was going to return to headhunters and recruiters and re-enter in the aging leadership workforce, or if I was going to take some time for myself to regroup. And I decided I would regroup in Africa. So I bought a ticket. And although that doesn't sound like the world's most logical path at the time, and in hindsight, it was probably one of the best decisions I could have ever made. And so I went to East Africa and I spent a number of weeks in Tanzania. And there, one night in the Serengeti Plains, I saw a woman crying in a tent by herself. She was drinking a glass of wine and I sat down next to her and I said, are you okay? What's happening here? And she said, I'm not okay. I'm one of the top women's health doctors in London. I took weeks off from my medical practice to come here and do mission work and I'm seeing people die. There are children dying on clinic steps. There are no medical supplies anywhere and I'm helpless here and she bawled. And I think we each have these moments in our lives where we have this extraordinary compassionate connection to another in a horrible moment. And then we have these moments where it is far more than just a compassionate moment and we have to do something. So I came home and I wanted to figure out what is up with the medical supplies in our country and what is the opportunity to change the story I heard in the Serengeti Plains. So I started walking through the tunnels of the biggest hospitals in New York City with people working in the waste management tunnel screaming, lady, what are you doing down here? And I said, I wanna see what's being discarded and why. I, I wanna understand the opportunity to rescue supplies and send them abroad to sites that have nothing. And here's what I learned during this quest. In this country, the use of products is highly regulated from the federal government. Anyone on this program, if you have had surgery, there are supplies on the medical stand next to you in the operating room and every single OR in the United States has a back table of what if, what if you need more packing, more suturing, more anything. What ends up happening with those supplies because of regs is if they were around a patient, they must be discarded. So now we are looking at in the United States, these are not contaminated, hands have not touched, no blood contamination. We are looking at a 21.25 million ton opportunity of rescue before these supplies are thrown away. So these are the kinds of supplies that we're talking about. This is a chest tube insertion kit. This is a surgery pack. We're not talking about supplies that are unpacked. 
we're talking about supplies that are still in their sterile wrapping. And you juxtapose this in that clinic that I visited later on my trip in Africa, where they were doing an emergency C-section there. And the doctor midway through the section said, oh my gosh, there are no supplies to close. We have no sutures to close. And I said, how could you open a person's body without a way to close? And they said, we're gonna use gauze. And they literally held up a four by four piece of gauze that normally looks like this and started pulling the strings out of this to become a suture to close a woman as she's having a section. Juxtapose that against the fact that these are sutures and boxes of these sit in our warehouse shelves. So the opportunity is an enormous one. And since we have started Athia, and I named it Athia to honor the land that whispered and inspired this work so that we could do our job at rescuing as much as possible. Within that 21.25 million ton opportunity, Athia rescues 500 tons of medical supplies from New York's healthcare market every single year. And we started Athia as a passion project in my garage in Westchester County. And today we are in three warehouses. We have about 40,000 square feet of space. We're running two trucks in and out of New York and we have 20 in staff. And the mission has not changed since the beginning of our work. At Athia, we truly believe that healthcare is a human right. And what that means then is that we seek to empower and change healthcare globally in areas that are compromised and horribly under-resourced. It should, our means should not be our determinant around being able to seek out and receive healthcare when we are sick. So what we do is we divert, sort, and deliver these supplies worldwide. So how do we do this? Part of the magic, I believe, of Afia is that we partner. We don't covet this work. We don't work in a silo. Our work is generated and improved because of the extraordinary partnerships we have in rescuing these supplies, sorting them at our warehouse, and then who we distribute them to abroad. Some of our partners to date have included Bloomberg, Regeneron, the CDC Foundation, um, UJA Federation of New York, the Office of Emergency Management in New York City, um, the New York State Governor's Office, and we will be talking about this soon, the Greenwald Family Impact Foundation, but we are stronger as a team than we are working in isolation. So what sets us apart? What sets us apart is that we only send what people are asking us for. And this is crucial. I, I, years ago, I was on a port police boat in the waters of the Aegean Sea as people were fleeing from Turkey to Lesbos. And I remember sitting with the port police saying, what do you have to resuscitate children when you pull them from the water? And they said, we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. We do CPR and that's all we have. And a month later, we sent them defibrillators and emergency urgent care supplies for respiratory and cardiac arrest. And it made an enormous difference in their capacity. Another good example of this was I was in Malawi and I was working with this incredible midwife in the bush with Partners in Health. And I followed her and I said to her, Gladys, you know precautions for HIV. Why are you barefoot and you have all these open sores? You, you know, you know. And she said, of course I do, but I can't do anything about that because I don't have enough money to buy shoes. I have enough money to keep my children sheltered, to buy food, but I don't have money for my own shoes. And I'm an occupational therapist. And so much of the governing philosophy of Afia's work is based on a huge scan of what is out there, what is needed, and how can we match with product to make a difference. And I thought I'm never going to get surgical boots from any of the doctors we're working with because people wear them to their last breath. Um, but what would be a substitution? And we decided to start collecting used rain boots because they have the same protective nature and product. So now in the bush in Malawi, these remarkable midwives are in these 
bedazzled neon boots and they are protected as they bring in life. And so those products are combined with the medical products that we're sending, but only sending people what they ask for. That is a key to the work that we do. Okay, our work touches three key areas of impact. And I think this trifecta is incredibly unique and powerful. Uh, the first and foremost is our work in global health. And here we have sent over $39 million worth of medical supplies to 79 countries in just 13 years of operation. And I think one of the pieces that I feel strongly about with this work is not only are we helping people to change healthcare abroad, but I believe we are interrupting the exodus of very well-trained doctors and nurses who have no reason to stay in these rural areas of healthcare delivery if they don't have the tools they need to practice their trade. So people who don't have something as simple as a stethoscope or surgical instruments, it, it, there's a reason for them to leave. And if we can help staff stay, I think we have a generational impact on the well-being of that nation and health clinics in that specific area. So to do this, we work in four specific areas. One is elder care support. And my work as a clinician was in aging for 25 plus years. So this area is um, very close to my personal and professional heart. Um, and what we do there is we collect supplies from the bereaved. When people die in the United States, this is another opportunity. Everything is thrown away. No one is going to come and pick up the bed, the commode, the unused chucks, and we collect those and have changed uh, the delivery of care for elders in Puerto Rico after Maria, We've done unbelievable work in the Cape Town townships and in Navajo Nation during COVID there. Um, we made a big impact on the care of elders across multiple tribes. Um, so that is one piece. The next is healthcare strengthening. And there we go into hospitals or districts abroad and we make a sweeping change in the delivery of care with the supplies that they need and making sure they have what they need. The third area is we are a safety net for the United States federally qualified health centers. And if we ever saw the disparity of care and the lack of equity, we are seeing it in COVID um, in our country. And we have made our products available to the federally qualified health centers serving the poorest communities in our nation. And you know, we helped Harlem United during COVID and they said to us, in addition to keeping our staff protected, could you please give us ambulation devices, canes, walkers, crutches, wheelchairs? The thinking is that if these folks could reduce their risk for a fall, they wouldn't end up in an ER getting treatment and exposed to COVID. And so they thought in an incredibly proactive, preventive way. In Staten Island, they couldn't deliver dental care because they had no face shields to protect the dental practitioners who were treating the patients through these centers and we sent them pallets of face shields and then dental care opened up. The COVID has invited us to the domestic healthcare stage because we had to show up for local needs and help people treating the poorest of the patients. The fourth area is our disaster hub. And with climate change and what is happening in our world, disasters are happening on a far quicker, more rapid, more catastrophic level these days. And we are pre-positioning. We are very well set up for our ability to respond. And we've become the place where many folks in New York donate their in-kind supplies so that we can move them quickly. The second area, and we talked about this earlier, is environment. Our ability to become the one of the major greening solutions for the hospitals of New York is a significant one. There is no reason for these supplies to be incinerated and buried in landfill. And we have about 20 unique major medical systems in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut who donate steadily to us to the point where they are running trucks of pallets into Athia when they have a surplus of inventory that has to be moved. And I think what's really unique about this is New York Presbyterian, Memorial Sloan Kettering, NYU, Sinai, Monty Einstein are all finding their way 
to using us as a viable solution, as are private doctors, nursing homes, corporations, um, and closing hospitals. And when the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation closed two of their big hospitals in the city, they gave them to us and said, decant these hospitals. And we had containers running in and out of those loading docks for weeks as we put post-its and stickers on, this color goes to Ghana, this color goes to Tanzania, this goes to South Africa. And I think what's really important here is we have prevented 11 million pounds from being thrown away for no reason at all when it could save someone's life abroad in the New York metro area. And finally, and this is a beautiful contribution of the work, is our community. And um, I am a firm believer in the transformative nature of altruism. And as a therapist, um, I have seen in the giving to others is the giving to self. So we have thousands of volunteers at Afia every year helping us. COVID has made that very challenging and we've had to model in very creative, innovative ways around this, but they are our, they make it possible for us to have this impact abroad. And so amongst those, they are students, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, retirees, universities, corporations. And we also have an extraordinary program um, for people on the spectrum, people with IDD, um, long-term psychiatric illness, they have to be given a chance to give back as well. And I think if any population that comes to Athia understands this the best, it's probably them, this in the giving to others is the giving to self. And I supervise 12 to 15 graduate occupational therapy students every three months doing their field work at Afia and they work one-on-one -on -one with these folks. So they come to Afia and then all of a sudden people are interviewing and securing employment. And we realize the power of this, just where do you get a chance to save someone's life? And they are the last hands to touch these supplies before they are shipped abroad. And there is extraordinary power in just that. And now we are starting to do more and more work um, with the prison and the incarcerated population, we are bringing sorting into the local jails. And we are working with people on probation and parole to give them the same opportunity. Um, it, is, um, it is an opportunity to get your hands into sorting and moving supplies to preparing them for shipment. Nothing that comes into Afia is in a nice, neat, clean box. So we are getting bags of multiple products in these supply donations. And it means that all hands are on deck helping us to make this a reality. So your impact is greater with Afia. Um, and importantly here, I, we all believe that we offer an excellent return on investment by making these customized deliveries available that are valued at a minimum of three to four times what it takes for us to recover, pack, and ship. So investing in Afia means that there is going to be a generational impact. If we can change one mother's story who safely delivers her child, then we impact the generations to follow from that family. And why we are thrilled to receive financial donations, there are some key areas where we are now looking for help. And I'm going to share some of those with you, hoping that this will spark um, some connections that could really further benefit and build our work. The first is we have grown now from over the years, from literally my garage to being in 40,000 square feet of space. And we are in need of a supply chain Six Sigma ops specialist who could come in and help us look at these three warehouses and the incoming of goods, the packing, the staging, and the shipping. We need, um, we need a renovation of processes and we need an expert to come into the fold and help work with an amazing committed team. This is not about winning over the team, the team is begging for it. So we are ready and primed for someone to come in with this expertise, that's one. Two is, we need introductions to people with planes, trains, and automobiles. That was a great movie. And now we need help in all of these areas. We are working closely with JetBlue 
on disasters in the Caribbean and they are our partner where we load up planes with the supplies and they are able to deliver it. But anyone with private planes that when a disaster hits would be open to carrying in cargo. Anyone with connections to South Africa Air or KLM or Delta or the big airlines that fly into Africa would be a game changer for us. Similarly, container shipping lines, Maersk and others. Um, and finally, I've been trying to crack this nut for years. Target, Walmart, Kmart, big national trucks with dead space on one of their routes. And if we could access one of those routes, it would, it would make half of the domestic work we're doing different. Um, it is an enormous process trying to find ways to get domestic trucking reduced or donated to us. And a perfect example of this was Cedar sinai a number of years ago was redoing their ER in LA and they offered us the supplies and it was going to cost way over $10,000 for us to move from Cedar sinai to New York. And it just becomes an unaffordable prospect, but that's where we could really use help with people who have connections and can innovate with us around the logistics of international and domestic um, transport. Next is we are building our corporate and social responsibility contacts, and we would love more. Uh, we, during the beginning of COVID, we did remarkable work and are continuing with Regeneron. And they funded our work. They had a huge sort and are having another one with our supplies outside under an open tent at their corporate headquarters in Westchester. Um, and it also provides an opportunity for employees to help us collect the ancillary supplies, for example, that would make a big difference in the shipment that we are sending. We just did a big project in, with um, the Bloomberg um, Corporation and Foundation, and they funded our ability to get supplies out to Navajo Nation and they also, the welcome back to Bloomberg corporate event was 500 of their employees making 10,000 kits for us to send as pre-positioned hurricane preparedness kits. And it's going to make an enormous difference for people there. But this is where we wanna build um, corporate partnerships and have so many opportunities for employees to get involved and to have hands-on experience in giving back and doing good. Uh, influencers and potential spokespeople who can help us get the word out. Uh, we have had so many people come to Afia and literally walk into the warehouse and say, this is unbelievable. Why didn't I know about you? <laughs> well, because we're doing so much work that that is an element that we need far more help in getting the word out. So people who have following and people who are known in communities who can get the word out about us would, um, be enormously helpful. Um, and that's also how we build more work together. And finally, we are welcoming constantly introductions to family foundations or giving circles that align with the many tenets of AFIA. I mean, you heard about our environmental work, our global health work, and our community building work. And I think there's a home here for so many in terms of where we can align. Um, and I'm going to close by just saying that um, because this need exists abroad, we do. And it is our privilege and our honor to be the voice and the activators around helping people to have their story just like we get to live ours. So thank you and thank you for the opportunity to share our work with you. Thank you, Danielle. That was amazing. I think your your passion really shines through. It's very inspiring. And you know, one of the things that I love about Afia and the reason that Force Family Office wanted to have this platform for you is that you do save lives in so many different ways. You know, not only are you doing the 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 supply work, which is so important you are using what is already existing. You are doing, you are repurposing things, which is so valuable. And you're looking at very obvious manageable solutions and you were getting rid of this waste that existed and making sure that it gets to the right people and you're customizing it. And I love, and I'm gonna get back to you and talk about a little bit more 
later, your volunteer program, because I think it's incredible that you also give people an opportunity to find a way to give back in a way that's manageable, that works with whatever disability they may have, but they can still be very much a part of the organization and do that kind of work. And, you know, I think you're a true angel and, and a hero. And I think that people like you and your organization deserve all the support. Now, obviously, you are a nonprofit, which means you need money. Of course you need money. So I'm not gonna lie, guys out there, there's a link in the chat. Please feel free to go on and donate. Please think about incorporating Afia into your own philanthropic gifts over the next year or so. Um, they're an amazing organization and they deserve funding. But this presentation is much more about what you were just talking about, all the things beyond the check. And that brings me to Jonathan. Jonathan Greenwald, because Jonathan is someone who is very successful in his own right in his for-profit businesses, but he found a way to use that success to create a foundation, to partner with other organizations, and to really do his part to change the world and to have return on investment and impact. And so, Jonathan, I'd like to turn things over to you to introduce yourself your family, your passions, your work, your partnerships, and everything that makes you the magical human that I know that you are. So Jonathan, please uh, take it away. Lisa, thank you very much for the very warm welcome. And thank you for the Force Family Office for this platform and Danielle for all the amazing work that you and everyone at AFI is doing. Um, my name is Jonathan Greenwald. I'm the managing member and founder of Core Asset Group, and we are a private equity investor. Um, we we uh, invest in a variety of different areas. Most recently, we focus on um, impact investing around um, environmental issues. Um, several years ago, we've uh, several years ago, several of our portfolio companies were manufacturers of of multiple products and supplies. And um, we were partnering with local charities, communities, and others to provide them um, and assist on an ongoing basis for particular drives. Um, during, during the last hurricane of the Bahamas, Hurricane Dorian, um, it became apparent that we can be doing a lot more. So through one of our portfolio companies, and that's one of the things that we look to do. So we look to lever our own portfolio companies to assist causes that we can make a difference in. So IC formulations, we're a manufacturer of uh, wellness supplies, vitamin supplements, creams, topicals, lotions, others. Um, Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas and we were able to thankfully be able to send over significant amounts of um, children's supplies, vitamin supplements, others. Um, we're based here in Miami and through one of our other affiliate organizations, which I'll get to when we discuss uh, smart partnerships, we're able to lever a lot of existing supply chains, infrastructure, relationship contacts. Another one of our other portfolio companies is Integrity Hempceuticals. We're a manufacturer, we're a brand in the, uh, also in the wellness space around um, di different wellness products. Um, Recently, there was the uh, Surfside building collapse. And again, it's, it's a, a terrible tragedy. We were looking for ways to assist people. So we had donated all sales directly towards the survivors and the families, again, through one of our uh, partnerships, smart partnerships, we were able to assist people with things that we already do in house. Um, additionally, some of our other portfolio companies are very active in the, um, in the environmental space, either creating green, clean energy, waste, plastic tires, or water purification. Those are two areas of focus. And there through direct investments, we can actually make impacts both on the environment, create local jobs, um, clean the environment, and, and hopefully leave the, uh, the world a little better place than we found it. As we move forward, and we founded, I founded um, TIGFIF, the Greenwald Family Impact Foundation. We looked at ways to lever our own existing infrastructures and people we knew. Um, coming from Wall Street, 
I'm, I'm very familiar with the fund to fund models where we look to aggregate the, the best and the brightest and then focus our voice and impact in ways that give many people exposure to many different opportunities. And in doing that, we create an impact multiplier effect where small amounts, whether they be capital and capital can come in dollars, it could be come in time, it can be that relationship, it can be that influencer, it can be um, that logistics company. Um, these are all different ways. It could be that empty warehouse in an area that, that, that can be used and relevered. It could simply be raising awareness of what several groups are doing. AFIA, as an example, that people don't know about a lot of these amazing, amazing organizations on a local and regional level, but for the lack of that knowledge. But with exposure, people then get involved and they, they take a stand for them and they help to assist. So one of the missions of TIGFIF is to really raise the awareness of certain particular areas of focus that we're involved in and allow people to both know about them and participate in a meaningful way um, beyond just making a donation. And so in our smart partnerships, we've also assembled different groups. So one of our organizations, um, we are down here in Miami, we provide primarily disaster relief, very rapid relief, primarily around hurricanes, but other natural disasters. And that is a, a global empowerment mission. We run operations throughout the US, throughout the Caribbean. We're active in Haiti. We most recently have sent about 15 or 20 um, container loads of supplies to St. Vincent's. It's an island um, um, down in the southern part of the Caribbean where they had a volcano about two weeks ago. And Afia was one of our smart partners in that organization, in that uh, particular operation where they very generously um, gathered materials that were needed specifically in the island, brought them down to us in Miami where we repacked them in our warehouse we, we have a 20,000 square foot warehouse down here that we're constantly sending primarily food, water, um, personal hygiene. Um, Alfia sent uh, um, uh, medical supplies and we were able to marry those with our container ships that were going down to St. Vincent's and we were able to multiply the effect where we provided the last mile, we had people on the ground, we were already shipping, so we both increase the overall, I guess it would be an ROI, even though we don't really count it that way, but by levering each other's core strengths and capabilities, we were able to deliver life-saving supplies in a very cost-effective manner, very rapidly. Um, we're proud to say that we had people on the ground in St. Vincent's within 36 hours of the, uh, the first eruptions. And, um, well in advance of most of the others. Again, that is because we have relationships with private air ca uh, carriers who were able to donate um, aircraft to get our people down there and supplies very, very rapidly. Um, other, other groups in our smart partnerships include, so I mentioned Global Empowerment Mission. And I think in the last, in the last um, uh, 18 months, we've delivered about $35 million in direct um, um, disaster relief supplies, um, be, be it in the Caribbean. We currently have um, operations running out in the fires on the West Coast. Um, it, it's not a matter of, of if, it's a matter of when something's going to happen. And one of our core missions there is we pre-position supplies um, in our Miami warehouse, but we're also starting to strategically deploy them around the states through one of our logistics partners where when something happens, we can move things very rapidly. So we're proactive, we're not responsive. And that's sort of the mission there on that side. But we also do a lot of other things where we, we assist schools in Haiti, where we, um, we've been supporting several schools in Haiti since the earthquake, where some of the initial 
um, kids, orphans who are in the school are now in college and we continue to pay the tuitions, give them a stipend, support their families. And these people um, are, are gonna make a difference in the world. Um, no doubt about it, um, they're, they're proud, they're working hard and they're looking to make a difference. So in the schools that we run over there, we provide um, books, uh, supplies, co um, computer labs, computers, food, um, graduation gifts. And it's an ongoing, ongoing need. Um, you know, other, other areas of impact, and this is actually something that we're looking and that we are expanding now with AFIA is where we're already providing um, basic necess uh, necessities after disaster. Again, the food, water, um, um, personal hygiene. Uh, through our partnership with AFIA, we're now providing uh, medical supplies, primarily for first responders. So where we currently deliver a box of supplies, five people, five days, food, water, we'll now be able to deliver an additional box in the, the uh, first responder essentials kits where one box will assist maybe 100 people with first aid, with sutures, with triage, with the things that after a disaster in those first 24, 48 hours, they're lacking of and will be able to play our part. Um, those are the main things that we're doing. We're also community focused. So it can be with educational initiatives where, where we assist it. Um, we work with several um, partnerships down in South Florida, uh, um, Amigos Kids, um, Little Lighthouse, a volunteer organization where they're constantly in the community. Um, so we either provide them with supplies or we provide them with a program that they can bring their volunteers to. And it's constantly evolving. We, um, in many ways, we're very opportunistic in ways that we can assist as long as they come into our basic areas of focus, which is environment, uh, rapid disaster response, and um, supportive communities. Where we find is I often find several of my colleagues um, on, the, uh, on the financial side. A lot of them want to be involved in programs, but they didn't even know that these existed. And we typically, we just tell them about stuff. We rarely ask. We just tell them what we're doing, why I can't get to that, that party or that golfing event because we're doing something else. And suddenly someone shows up with either supplies or a phone call or an introduction to someone who will provide a specific thing. One of the things that we continually need is again, personal hygiene is a big uh, issue. Soap, shampoos, others that we provide. And, um, you know, in the end of the day, it, it's often not only who you know and what you know about them, but what the relationship is. And so we look to, we, we're, we're really looking to assist ways that everyone, family offices, private investors, um, um, individuals, can get involved in something that becomes more systematic and programmatic, that it's not a one and done. They can embrace it. And there's no amount that's too small. And quite frankly, there's no amount that's too large because the need will always be there. But by working collaboratively in a smart, efficient way, we believe that we're um, providing benefits to many people that we'll never even know. And that's sort of what the driving force is of what we're doing at Tick Fifth and through a lot of our smart partnerships. That's amazing, Jonathan, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things I know you and I had discussed and Afia and I had also discussed is that you said there's no, you know, no amount too small, um, but you know, people don't understand that free is not actually free. And this is a really important thing I want everybody on this call to pay attention to. Even when we repurpose supplies, even when generous people donate shampoos or donate equipment or donate anything else, there is a hard cost 
for every donation that's received of warehousing the supplies, of organizing the supplies, the cost of, of boxes and containers, the cost of fuel, the cost to truck things. So even when you think, okay, this is an organization that's been substantially donated to in terms of, of supplies, there is always a hard cost, even for the people that are, are giving so much, people like Jonathan, you know, he has this warehouse in Miami, that warehouse is not free for him. Uh, you know, to get the supplies, he, he mentioned having sort of a go bag, you know, ready kits, things ready to go out there to the communities that need it. Somebody still has to pay to get it there. And so one of the things and the discussion points, I, you know, I, I love that Afia and Jonathan have managed to um, meet each other and find ways to work together. But that's the main thing we really want to talk about today. Again, please support financially 100%. They really need it. But think about who you know, even if you don't have a dollar to spare, everybody has relationships. I know this. Who do you know that's at Walmart for Afia? Who do you know that, that has a, a top relationship at Delta? Actually, in that case, it's probably me. So we can talk after this call. But think about who you know and how you can help who you know that might want to actually volunteer and participate. I, I really think that that's, that's very important. So. I don't want to ignore our audience because they've been listening. And I know that there are some questions that have come in, but guys, if you're out there listening and you have questions, please put them in the chat so that I can get to them. Otherwise I'm gonna hog this conversation because I could talk to these guys all day. Um, the first question that I see did come in from William. Uh, this is a question I think for Afia, so Danielle. Um, how do you know how much product or funding is required for the safety net, especially during COVID or disasters? Is your approach to ask for funding to gain access to the materials that are required? Or do you, or I, so I guess the question is, you know, you, you said you only give to what is asked for. How do you know? Where, where are the relationships coming from where you find out what's needed and get it to them? So that's an amazing question because um, the beginnings of our work with the federally qualified health centers in this country um, no one believed that we were asking them what they needed. Um, it was shocking and we weren't getting lists. So part of the model is predicated on the volume that we're being asked not to pay for and source, but to pull from our existing warehouse. Behind me is an incubator. As an example, we have a biomed team that safety ensures every single piece of biomed machinery. So when we're getting back to like, what are the costs? The costs are what matching the volume and types of supplies we're being asked for um, with the costs of making sure we can bring it in, wrap it, prepare it, and deliver it. And so we match projects to the costs of the project that we have in front of us. And that's how we figured it out. So the CDC Foundation supported our ability to get 50 pallets into New Jersey's system as they were closing these centers, but it was predicated on what they were asking us for. And then we know what we need to raise in response to the volume they're asking for. Well, we don't purchase our supplies. We are all about giving them a second life because they should have a second life. And that actually brings me to another question um, that, that came up, which is, does Afia have another big project in the in the works? And if you do, um, what is needed for that specific project? So can you tell us sort of what's next in the queue and what you need to facilitate? So there, what I love about this work is bridges are constantly presenting themselves to us. So issue one is there is a massive COVID uptick in the continent of Africa. Um, and there are hotspots that have been identified by the CDC, Uganda, Malawi, Kenya, South Africa. And there's, they, they don't have PPE. Um, so I'm concerned from a, both a protect the healthcare provider perspective, but I'm really concerned about what happens when there's a slaughter of um, the smartest and the brightest and the best in healthcare to these communities and who's gonna provide care in the long term. So we are being offered by major hospitals and organizations in New York that is managing their way through COVID very well, um, a, a mammoth amount of stockpiled PPE. And so what I wanna be able to do is match and consolidate 
what these countries and their ministries of health need with what I do not want to have thrown away in New York. So it is a perfect bridge to build. And when we spoke to the South African consulate recently, they said, this may be one of the first times we actually have to think about buying and securing PPE. And I have to tell you that there are so many people um, selling suboptimal goods out there that they are cautious and concerned and nervous about this. And so we had a whole conversation about, you can count on us because we insist on certificates for everything that we've ordered or anything that's been given to us to date is um, meets a quality level of PPE. So Lisa, I need to raise $250,000 so I can move at least a hundred pallets of PPE that is worth way more. I mean, it is like, it is way over, um, I'd say 1.2 million in PPE to these sites so that we can start to protect their healthcare staff. Because right now they are exposed and they are getting sick and they are dying. Yeah, and look, everybody read articles about how much fraud there was in PPE, how many you know people were jumping in to make a buck, to make money selling fake product. When, when it's coming through you from the hospitals directly, you know that you're sending safe equipment. And that can't, can't be undervalued either because they could get taken advantage of, spend money they don't have on product that actually could hurt people. And with you, they have that, that security and that, and that, that assuredness, which is incredible. Um, one of the next questions, uh, this one looks like it is for Jonathan. Um, can you dive a little bit more deeply into what you mean by smart partnership? And I'm tacking onto that question. That was the question. But when you say a smart partnership, how do you identify the companies that you can have smart partnerships with? No, great, great question. Thank you. So a smart partnership is going to be something where we don't have to reinvent the wheel and that we can build on certain core competencies and then expand it into an existing program, project, or service. As an example, with Afia and TIGFIF and what we're doing in the Caribbean with medical supplies, um, Afia has um, high quality material in New York looking to be repurposed and find a home. Um, we are based in Miami, we have warehouse facilities, and we're already sending material there in response to disasters. So we're now expanding our, our, our uh, SKUs, the amount of the, the types of products that we could send, and we're already doing it. So it's very cost effective for us to be working together there. Another example in that same vein would be it can be a, um, a, a Johnson & Johnson of the world, and they have an overproduction, or something is returned perfectly good, but it's been scratched and nicked. They can donate to us in kind, and they get a full write-off for it. So something that they would have had to dispose of, we're suddenly, we find a home for them. Um, we find a home for the, the material. It's both a, a socially good decision to make and it's a strong financial decision as well. Um, Aviators Without Borders, um, organization around for about 50 plus years in Europe. The, um, we have a partnership with their US chapter where they have a lot of light aircraft, volunteer pilots and light aircraft. Oftentimes after let's say a hurricane or a tornado hits in certain areas, um, the airports are closed to commercial for 24, 48 or longer hours, but light aircraft can often get in. So we work with them and they provide aircraft pilots and then we provide supplies and first responders to go in. Um, a smart partnership is virtually anything that is, that is leveraging each other's competencies without redundancy and replicating the wheel. Awesome. And you know, that actually blends so well with whoever, I don't know who anonymous attendee is, but whoever they are, they asked um, Afia, if you can share an example of a partnership with either a high net worth individual or a family foundation that's actually worked really well. So we yes. talked about the smart partnerships with companies, but what, what about a smart partnership with, with a family or an individual? 
Um, or um, I, actually, I would love to just show what happened in New York with the Robin Hood Foundation. So I think that would be really, that would be a very good example here. So Robin Hood Foundation, um, we are so aligned in our work around um, intervening and supporting those living in poverty. Uh, and they provided Afia with, initially, they have since given us a second grant $100,000 grant to help the federally qualified health centers in New York City with the supplies they need. And this was a time where um, A, New Jersey federally qualified health centers were closing because they didn't have the supplies they needed to stay protected or to afford purchasing enough to deliver care. One, two, in Brooklyn, there were two major health centers out the gate that had an 80% COVID positive rate. So who was gonna treat the patients in that community? I mean, it was, it was layers deep and becoming increasingly disastrous. And one of the things they said was we don't have enough pulse ox. Like we don't do this kind of assessing of this level of pulse oximeters in our centers. It's not normally a need. And we were able to get to them close to $900,000 in value of just pulse oximeters. I mean over 40,000 pulse ox were delivered to multiple centers that said that they had nothing. And so what it did was it was an alignment of, this is who we are all interested in helping. And the investment in our ability to help them turned out to be close to a million dollars in delivery of goods that these centers would never have been able to afford. And you know, just the, the use of the term investment, I know there's a lot of investors on the call and you know we all measure things in in ROI, but like let's not forget about ROH. You know, return of heartbeats, return of of life that we say, yes. return of of actually feeling connected to a society, to a people, to a world. And I really think that you know, Marissa, if you don't mind putting the slide back up that just kind of shows the beyond the check asks that Apia has, um, and Jonathan, I can just ask you verbally. We don't have a lot of time left, so I do want you guys to have an opportunity to just remind everybody, because this, this whole topic is about beyond the check. Again, please send money, but beyond money, what can anybody on this call do for you today that might be really valuable? Like I know you, you put PR contacts and, and influencers. So, you know, my actor friends, who do we know that's got a big platform? Um, Danielle, I know you mentioned to me, Lin-Manuel publicized work in yes. front of and it, it made a, a massive difference. So I mean, that was a creative, and that was, that, was, that was a moment of just beautiful, innovative thinking from someone on his team. Lin-Manuel brought Hamilton to Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and it was a means of fundraising for the arts that were decimated on the island following the storm. And so, he, uh, some a member of his team said, we have all these people, Atlantic Records was going, Congress men and women were going from DC, um, Shonda Rhimes team was going, and they said to us, what can we all do that would also impact the work that you're doing on the island? And all these teams brought medical supplies and she had that innovative thought of how do I build the bridge between Lynn heading to Puerto Rico and the medical needs that are happening there. And even though we're focusing on the arts, we can still benefit you as we bridge into Puerto Rico. And thousands and thousands of pounds of medical supplies were carried into San Juan in these orange luggage flight duffel bags because Lynn's team innovated in this way. It was amazing. So again, who do we know in PR that will donate some time just to get the word out that Afia exists? I'm a New Yorker and I'm really into philanthropy and I didn't know about Afia until this year. You know, and Force introduced Danielle and Jonathan. And those are the magical ways that we can help. So anyone with contacts in aviation or trucking, I think that's going to be helpful to both Jonathan and to Danielle. Um, people with, with warehouse space. I mean, Jonathan, I would, you know, you can speak for a minute about what you need. I know you have a warehouse, but that comes with things. What, what could really help you in terms of um, people on this call? No, no, absolutely. So down here in Miami, so we, we just, um, we had a ribbon cutting about two months ago for our new warehouse. It's about 20,000 uh, plus square foot and we've outgrown it. Um, and now we're looking for additional space. So if someone has underutilized warehouse space in the Doral area, um, 
we have both a professional staff. We're primarily volunteer driven, but we do have a professional staff. So we do we um, we have operating expenses, whether it's uh, salaries, insurance, rent, other things. Um, again, there really is no shortage of the need, but we definitely do need additional space in the Miami area. Okay, so real estate guys and girls, you heard it, you have space, get in touch with Jonathan. I wanna hit up again, consultants in supply chain management. So many of you own businesses that have a deep supply chain. Please, if you have resources, if you have a consultant, if you have someone that can help them streamline, let us know. Um, obviously introductions to family foundations, we're gonna do our best for you there. Um, but, but please, you know, contacts in CSR of companies. Who did you go to college with that's working in CSR? Check your own LinkedIn, see who you can connect them with. Um, we don't have a lot of time and I did wanna to get to the volunteer program, which we didn't really get to speak about. But again, anybody on this call, feel free to follow up with us at Force Family Office. We can connect you directly to Jonathan and directly to Danielle. Please, please let us know how you can help, even if all you can do is post about it on your social media, even if all you can do, I mean, if one more friend tells me they have a podcast, if you have a podcast, please use it um, and, you know, get in touch with us. We will connect you with Afia and Jonathan. I wish we had more time. You guys were so compelling. Um, we do have to, to say goodbye, but again, anyone that's on this call, you can follow up with Force. We can put you in direct contact. Please think about who do you know, what can you give, how do you help, because the return on this investment is massive. As Danielle said, three, four, five times the amount of supplies given is the effect that we have. So we do have to wrap up today, but thank you all for joining us. Um, we love our Force for Good series here at Force Family Office, and together we really can make a difference. So thank you guys so much for coming today and please do follow up with us. And Danielle and Jonathan, thank you for your participation. You're both incredible. Thank you very much for the inclusion. Thank you. Thanks everyone, have a great day.